Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 18. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods of your fathers, and serve your fathers served beyond the rivers and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out, who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all our ways that we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. The occasion for the exhortation that Ella read for us a moment ago referred to by James Montgomery Boyce as the captain's last sermon is found in the very first verse of Joshua chapter 24. Thirty years after he led the people across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land, now 110 years old and nearing the end of his life, we're told that Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and some of the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. We may miss if we don't read carefully when we're going through the Old Testament that Shechem is one of the places where God confirmed his covenant to Abraham and to his sons and children. And so Joshua comes back to Shechem because once again, God is calling his people to covenant faithfulness. Once again, God is working with his people. So just as Moses had gathered the tribes on the plains of Jordan to impart one last message, Joshua does the same here. These words recorded for us in Joshua chapter 24 would be his last words to the people that he had led or helped to lead for about seven decades of his life. And under the circumstances, we might expect something weighty. But if biblical exposition can be defined as communicating the meaning of a text or passage of scripture in terms of contemporary culture with the specific goal of helping people to understand and obey the truth of God, and that's exactly the definition of biblical exposition, then these words from Joshua are not just famous last words. They are a sermon because he is expounding to the people of Israel within their contemporary time at the end of his life the words of the Lord and the words of the Lord that are pointing back to earlier days in Israel's history. Look how Israel's captain and deliverer begins in verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. So what follows then is not the word of Joshua, Joshua is not standing up and saying, there are some things that I've been wanting to share with all of you for a very long time. Joshua is getting up and saying, this is the word of the Lord. This is what God says. This is Joshua speaking as a prophet. This is God speaking to his people through the one whom he had chosen to lead them. And speaking through Joshua, God recounts the whole history of his people. As we noted, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Remember that it will be important not only in this sermon, but in all of your understanding of scripture. God did not call Abram or his family because they were faithful people who were serving the one true God and had been doing so for generations. 
God called Abram as an act of his unmerited favor, a work of grace. God called Abram out of pagan darkness. And he went on to say, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But to Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. You can read the subsequent history for yourselves in verses 6 to 13. There's a lot there, and it's certainly more than I can give consideration to this morning. But the important thing, and what I want us to recognize for now, is to realize that the invitation in the following verse was not a freestanding invitation. It did not come to Israel out of the clear blue sky. This was not Joshua speaking to a gathering of unbelievers and pagans holding a big evangelistic rally and encouraging them to try Jesus, as sadly more than one song has suggested. This is Joshua speaking to God's covenant people, at least some of whom were old enough to remember Egypt. They had been 20 years or younger when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea by the miraculous power of God. And they had seen all that God had done in the meantime, the way that he had provided for them as they walked through the wilderness on their way to the promised land, the way that God had shown miracle after miracle and grace upon grace. They were aware of these things. So this is Joshua preaching to the choir, as we might say today. And this message, this invitation that Joshua gives is not for pagans, it is for the church. It is not a call to repentance and to life and salvation. It is a call to commitment. It was and it is a call to holiness and service. We see it in the very opening words of verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. And the therefore here in Joshua 24 is not unlike the therefore in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where the apostle Paul wrote, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. And why therefore? What's it therefore? What's the reason or the basis, the foundation for this appeal? Well, because Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you therefore. In light of what I just read, those verses, that doxology at the end of Romans chapter 11, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, because of who God is, and because of all that God has done, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. As Joshua said, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. In other words, you have received the grace of God, the very same grace that God showed to Abraham when he called him out of pagan, idolatrous night, the very same grace that God showed to Isaac and Jacob and the fathers when he confirmed his covenant with them over and over and over again. You have received that same grace. Now, therefore, live in that grace. Now, therefore, be holy in that grace. Joshua went on to say, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Note these references as you read through the Bible. Some of you are probably starting today 
with a brand new through the Bible in a year plan and you're going to come to some difficult sections where it's just kind of tough sledding. But if you read carefully, you'll see things like this where Egypt, when the Israelites were in Egypt, they, they weren't a faithful people. They weren't a people who was crying out to Yahweh, the Lord, to deliver them. They were a people who were crying out under the burden of slavery. And at the same time, they were serving the gods of Egypt, the very gods that God would judge in the plagues that he would bring as he delivered them and brought them out of that land of slavery. And Joshua is saying to their heirs, the next generation, put away those gods. Purify yourself. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, of course, in our society, we are more sophisticated than that, and so are our gods. We are more sophisticated, and our idols are more sophisticated than the gods that were served by the fathers beyond the river and in Egypt. We would never bow to Baal or Molech, or Dagon. We know right well that what the pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God, don't we? But consider Paul's words in Philippians chapter 3. He wrote, For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Now the Greek is literally whose God is their belly, and that's the way you would find it in the English Standard Version, but I think appetite gets to the intent, because this isn't just about food. It's about our appetites for earthly things. And I could make a list. Money. Sexuality, power, prestige, experience, novelty, the pursuit of happiness. All those things that people might typically have on their bucket list, which if you have one, you shouldn't. All those earthly things that we covet and desire in this life, even though we know that in the end, apart from God, they're all meaningless. Not only are they meaningless, in the end, apart from God, they lead to destruction. These things are the idols before whom we bow. These things are the gods of our age. These are the things that we must put away if we would be set apart, if we would be made holy as living sacrifices that are acceptable to God, which is, of course, the point. It's simply our reasonable service. It's our rational duty given who God is and all that God has done for us. It's what we read in Joshua 24. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And just in case you didn't catch it the first time, Joshua says it again, serve the Lord. The people of Israel had been delivered from Egypt and from the wilderness for just this purpose, that they might worship and serve the Lord their God and that they might be a light to the nations. And if you have been saved, if you have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved Son, that was for the very same reason. We know and remember Paul's words in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But never, ever forget that verse 10 follows immediately after. You were saved by grace through faith, this not of yourselves, so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved by grace through faith, 
so that we can just enjoy ourselves and live our best life now and then go to heaven when we die. We were not saved by grace through faith so that we could spend the rest of our lives in this world in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. That was never the point. We're not saved so that God can be there for us. We are saved for good works so that we can be there to serve God. Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were saved to serve. Take that home. That's the whole sermon. We were saved to serve the Lord our God. And as the late Bob Dylan once sang, the truth is, you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. And I think Joshua would have agreed. And on that day, long ago, he gathered the covenant people together and he called out to them, If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, if you don't like bowing before the Lord of heaven and earth, the God who called our father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs, who led them down into Egypt and then led them back out again, who brought us across the Jordan River and provided us with manna in the wilderness and everything that we need. Even the soles of their shoes did not wear out for the 40 years that they walked in the desert. That in itself is a miracle. And Joshua is saying to the people of God assembled before him, if it is evil in your eyes to serve that God, well, choose this day whom you will serve. Elijah would make a similar appeal at the top of Mount Carmel. He said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? There's a metaphor. If the Lord is God... Follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. See, the question has always been not whether you're going to serve somebody, but which somebody are you going to serve? Because there is no such thing as spiritual neutrality. You're going to have to serve somebody, yes, indeed, and so you do. And on this first day of this new year, we're faced with the same challenge that hung in the air all those centuries ago. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, or the gods of this world that offer hollow, meaningless pleasures, and then don't even deliver on that. But if the Lord is God, if Jesus Christ has conquered death and hell and risen to the right hand of the Father for us to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he has, then follow him. If in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. If in Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, and we have, then may we choose and may we say as Joshua did so long ago, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have called us to yourself by your grace. You have gathered us here in this place by your word and spirit. And Father, we are be re being reminded from your word, and we will be reminded when we come to the table, that you have gathered us as your covenant people, and now you call us to offer ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable in your sight, for this is merely our reasonable service. As we go into a new year, Father, help us to forget the things that are behind and to press on towards the things that are ahead, 
looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at your right hand. That, Father, we may endure whatever this year may bring in the same way that we've gone through everything in our past, knowing that you hold us by the hand and you guide us with your counsel and that a day will come when you will receive us into glory. Work in us this day and this year, Father, all that is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.